Father God, uh, I am reminded this week, Lord, of your greatness and your holiness and your bigness. And Lord, how utterly small I am. We all are in comparison to who you are. Lord, that nothing good comes out of me unless it comes from you. And so, Lord, I just pray over our time together. I pray over the words, Lord. I pray as I share, God, that um, your truth will flow through me. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for the promise of living water that wells up inside of us. Lord, thank you for the rain that reminds us, Lord, of your word um, continuing to fill our lives. Lord, thank you that in um, a world of uncertainty, a world of exhaustion, a world of tiredness, a world of anger, Lord, a world where we are feel like we're constantly being torn apart, like the like the people that we are reading about this week in John 7 who are so divided over who you are. Lord, it doesn't change who you are. It doesn't matter if we all agree with who you are. Lord, you are who you are. You are truth. And Lord, um, we just lean into that tonight. Lord, I pray that um, we will see who you are in truth tonight through the words of John 7. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, as I said, we're in John chapter seven, and you guys know that. Um, so um, we are um, in a section of the book of John that is a series of um, Jewish feasts. And um, John is kind of showing us how Jesus is the fulfillment of these feasts. And so last week we looked at Passover. Um, this week we are in, and in the next couple weeks, in the Feast of Tabernacles um, or the Feast of Booths. I'm going to call it the Feast of Tabernacles because for whatever reason, I cannot say the word booths without it sounding like booze. So <laughs> we're in the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and this, it's actually, what's kind of cool is that this feast actually just happened um, a few weeks ago from when um, we're talking about this, it happened um, October 2nd through 9th was this, um, it's also called Sukkot or Sukkot, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, and it is a festival that happens, it's in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, but it's in fall and it's, um, um, there's a lot that's part of this festival. So I want to give you, before we really dive into the, the passage, I want to give you a little bit more of the context and background of this feast. Um, in the email that I sent out this week on the book of John um, uh, for our study, I, I sent a picture, a chart that kind of went through several of the feasts. So hopefully you were able to get some good background knowledge um, about that. So it took place in the seventh month. Um, and it was when they brought in the harvest. It's one of the two festivals where everyone who was Jewish would travel to Jerusalem. So the first one is Passover, which we um, studied about. And we've seen that a couple times already in the book of John, where everybody would make that pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate that feast. Um, this is another one where people would travel to Jerusalem. Um, it commemorates the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and they build these temporary shelters or little tabernacles. Um, they decorate them with fruits and branches. Um, the branches are supposed to um, have not fully covered the top so you can see through the roof and see the stars. So it would remind them of the, um, the time in the wilderness, and um, it would it was not supposed to block out all the winds so they could remember the winds that would have um, pounded them in, in the desert and that they were um, exposed to the elements for those 40 years. Um, and it was a seven day festival and then they would gather for a solemn assembly on the eighth day. Um, and it, so not only would it celebrate his, uh, God's provision um, for the world, um, I'm sorry, through the wilderness, but it would also, um, and the harvest. So um, it kind of had this like twofold, but really at the idea and the heart of it was God's provision for his people um, and his faithfulness and his protection. Um, and it also looked forward to a day um, where the final harvest, where we would dwell with him in his kingdom under his blessing. Um, we'll see, you can actually read about it in Leviticus 23, 33 through 43 has 
the whole of it. Um, and um, it was something that was commanded that they be, that they celebrate. But apparently, um, from the time of Joshua on to Nehemiah, um, they did not celebrate this. And when the exiles came back and were building the wall in Nehemiah 8, 13 through 18, it talks about how they discovered that God had commanded this festival. And so they celebrate this feast together. And so that's when they picked back up doing it and um, we're still doing it in Jesus's day. Um, and there's two really big important elements. Um, one is the lighting of the lamp. And I'm going to give you just a little tidbit about this because we're going to see this in our study next week. Um, when he says, I am the light of the world, um, they would light these four giant lampstands in the temple. And the light was said to, um, they were somewhere between like 75 to 150 feet tall and they would build ladders on them and then little Jewish boys would climb up the ladder and they would put oil in it and the light of these lamps was said to light all of Jerusalem that you could see all of the city um, and so it was bathed in light throughout this whole eight-day festival and the second um, really key element to this is the water pouring ceremony and we're going to get to that in just a little bit so that's a little bit of the background of what's going on. So let's start in verse one, uh, John chapter seven. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews feast of booths was at hand. So his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples may also see the works you are doing for no one works in secret. If he seeks to be known openly, if you do these things, show yourself to the world for not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to the feast for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. Okay, so I'm going to pause right there. Um, so a couple of key things that we see in here. Um, we see this idea in this place where John calls out the disbelief of Jesus's own brothers, um, that his own family did not believe in him. Um, and um, we'll... And there's a few other places in scripture in Mark chapter six and in Matthew chapter 13, where um, it talks about how Jesus was not able to do a good work in his hometown of Nazareth. Um, and we even heard John allude to it a couple chapters ago where he said something about um, not being um, accepted even in his own town. Um, and so we see this, um, that his brothers are calling him to come to Jerusalem with them from uh, for the Feast of Tabernacles. And he says, no, my time has not yet come, um, but you guys go ahead. And then we see him in secret go after him. Now on surface level, we look at this and we go, Jesus just lied to them. Like, what was that all about? Because he's not supposed to lie. But um, there are a couple places in scripture where there seems to be um, a, a precedent where deception can be used to preserve life. All right, so we see this in 1 Samuel 16, 2 through 4, where the Lord asks Samuel to go to Jesse and look at his sons and to anoint a new king while Saul is still on the throne. And, um, and Saul, Samuel says, um, the Lord's anointed is still on the throne. I can't go anoint another king. And he says, tell them that you've come to make a sacrifice to the Lord and take a heifer with you. And so he tells Samuel to deceive Jesse and his sons so that um, he can go under secret and not be um, to preserve his life from Saul. So we see that. We also see it in Exodus 1, 17 through 19, where the Egyptian midwives have been ordered to kill any baby Hebrew baby boys. And they says that they feared the Lord. Um, and so they allowed these baby boys to live. And when the officials from Egypt come and say, why did you do this? They lie to the, the officials and say um, that Hebrew women are more vigorous than Egyptian women and that they give birth before they arrive. And so that they couldn't do it. Um, 
And so often in scripture, we may see things that don't seem to add up. And so we have to ask some questions and understand we can't always just take it at face value and go, Jesus lied, he, but the Bible says don't lie. We have to realize that there's probably something in our, in our understanding that's missing and we need to do the detective work to kind of figure it out. So um, I think he chose not to go because he knew their disbelief. I think this is a subtle nod again to his omniscience. Because he knew that if he had gone with his brothers, his brothers would probably have either turned him in or had put him forth because they're telling him, you need to be public with, with what you're saying. Um, you can't do all this in secret. Um, and Jesus knew that if going with them was a danger to his life because his time had not yet fully come. And we continue to see that phrase over and over in the book of John. And to me, it's such a great reminder of God's perfect timing. He had chosen and he had um, laid out a plan for when Jesus would exactly um, die and, and be crucified. And it was during Passover, not during the Feast of Tabernacles. And so um, he does what he does to preserve his life. And then he goes down to the feast um, in secret. Verse 11, the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he is a good man, others said, no, he's leading people astray. Yet for the fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly about him. And about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? Um, so most Jewish boys and most Jewish families would have had a basic education as children around the Torah and knowing the book of the law, which is the first five books of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, but then but then they would either go into apprenticeship of a trade, like they would go into a fisherman, or um, it's believed Jesus would have studied under his father um, in in carpentry, um, but others were selected to, like, this is what the Apostle Paul, who um, studied under the Rabbi Gamaliel, um, Gamaliel, and so um, Jesus did not have that opportunity. He did not study under some rabbi, and so um, they're marveling at him because he had never studied. He had never been formally trained, um, and he was from a rural area, which um, was even more shocking to them because in a lot of ways that we have uh, made me think of, you know, we tend to have like uh, the idea of like a country bumpkin or somebody who isn't as um, doesn't have the opportunities maybe because they live in these far out reaching areas that doesn't have the opportunities that you would find in a big city. That's kind of the same idea. Jesus was from an area where he, he wouldn't have had the opportunity to study and to grow up under the, um, as a disciple under a rabbi. And so they're really shocked by um, what he knows and what he's saying. And Jesus answered them, verse 16, my teaching is not mine, but him who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Jesus answered them, I did one work, and, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So if you'll remember a couple chapters ago, he healed a man on the Sabbath, and that was really kind of the initial point where they said, we, this guy's got to die, like we're done. And so he knows that they're still harboring this within them, that he would have healed a man on the Sabbath. But Jewish law required that a baby boy be circumcised on the eighth day, on the eighth day of his life. And so if a baby boy's eighth day fell on Sabbath, they would still circumcise them because that law 
um, was above the Sabbath law. And so Jesus is saying, listen, you guys are cutting back um, a baby boy on the Sabbath. And yet I made a man whole on Sabbath and you're holding that against me. And I thought this was so fascinating, y'all. And I missed this the first time. And this is why I love um, sometimes digging a little deeper into language because Jesus uses the same language here of creation that he, he didn't just say, I healed a man. He didn't say, I forgave his sins. He says, I made a man whole. So he it, it holds this intonation of creation. Um, and it really, it made me think about how, um, and it harkens back to creation where God made man in his image. And so we see um, Jesus again, shifting us from in, uh, from an earthly and external judgment to an eternal and internal judgment. So he's moving us from an external earthly judgment to an internal eternal judgment. And it was common for culture to judge people's character by what they look like on the outside. Um, I can remember uh, when I was growing up in our church, we did this amazing Easter production and it was high level. Like everyone had to wear makeup. I mean, and I'm not just talking like makeup on your face. Like we, we made our skin darker. Um, and, and there was a big to do about costumes and certain costumes would give, um, would give picture of what character you were. And so there were your standard Israelite women who would have their head completely covered, no hair showing um, at all. There were Roman women who would wear a certain style of dress. There were the, what we called the wows or the women of the world who were um, more, um, let's say sinful women, maybe, um, they wore more um, showing clothing. They might show their hair. They wore jewels on their, um, on uh, their thing. The, the priests, they all wear different things that, that say something about who they are. And so in their culture, they have this, they can tell who a person is by what they look like on the outside. And what Jesus is saying is you continue to judge wrongly. Um, and he didn't come to judge the outside appearance or to judge by earthly standards. And John continues to point us over and over to Jesus's omniscience, that he is all knowing. So Jesus is able to look inside. He's able to look internally and see what our motivations are, what our heart is, what our mind is. And because of that, he can judge rightly and judge justly. And what I think is so interesting here is that it doesn't say do not judge. It says judge rightly. And I think that sometimes, um, even randomly at dinner tonight, my son, um, my six-year-old was pointing and he goes, mommy, you can't point because if you're pointing, then three fingers are pointing back at you. <laughs> and it made me think like how often we say that um, we even take the Matthew um, 7 verse where it says, don't judge lest you be judged. But if you keep reading through that passage, it actually calls us to a judging rightly. Um, I'm going to read that verse real quick because it was, um, this was pretty eye-opening for me as I kept reading it. Um, it's a, it talks about the log in your own eye when you're trying to get the speck out of your brother's eye. And it says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. And so what we are called to is wisdom and discernment. Um, and there, there is... I think there's a, a bad stigma, stigma that we give judgment. Um, but there is wisdom and discernment that calls us to, um, to understand when it is 
um, a place where we might be giving to dogs what is holy, or we might be throwing our pearls before swine. And so I, I think Jesus is giving us a very um, practical example right here. He's modeling right judgment because he chose not to go with his brothers and throw his pearls before swine because he knew if he went in that time and in that way that it wouldn't end the way that it was supposed to. It would have forced something toward his arrest or or um, it would have forced him to speak in a place where people weren't ready to listen to what he had to say and he would be um, throwing what gracious gift he had in front of someone that was not going to accept it. Um, if you remember back a few chapters ago, um, he, uh, John talked about um, the um, him not giving himself over to them. Do you remember that? Um, and so we see Jesus doing that. He's not giving himself over to these people. Um, and instead he is um, trusting in the father. Um, and um, so in our wisdom and discernment, um, we need to have that even in spiritual things. Um, this begged me to question again, where do I place value in, um, what do I place value on in church and in faith over the wholeness of another? Um, because we cannot forget that our creator is in the business of making us whole. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So I love this image of creating new wholeness in this man on Sabbath. And Jesus again saying, the law is not more important than the wholeness of another in me, this new creation that he has. And so the, the dissension continues with the people. Um, verse 25, some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come on my own accord. He who sent me is true. This is the second time. He who sent me is true, and you do not know him. I know him for I come from him and he sent me. They were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because the hour had not come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Um, so in this section, um, the Greek word that's used here for no, this is another example where sometimes our English language can help, we can lose because uh, it's my gut intonate, my gut was to go, oh, that means that they don't know God. Um, but the word no that's used here, it's not the same word. Um, for those of you who studied First Peter with us and Second Peter, we talked about this word gnosis of knowledge that is an intimate knowledge that's only gained through a firsthand relationship. That's not the knowledge they're talking about here. This word no means to behold or be aware. It's seeing that becomes knowing. It's like if we were to say, I see what you mean, um, it's that idea of, of revelation. Um, and so Jesus is saying, you see me and you see where I come from, Nazareth, but that's not where I'm really from. I don't come on my own, but um, I was sent by someone that you have not beheld, that you have not seen, and that he, God, is true and only Jesus has seen him. And so it's I've seen him. I know where I come from. You don't know where I come from because you have not seen Jesus, God. And John continues again. He uses that phrase, his hour had not come. Um, and, um, you know, I love God's continued protection over Jesus in these places um, and how, um, and I think Jesus coming in secret uh, and then coming into the, it doesn't make sense to us. We're like, he came in secret and then he went into the temple court. Remember, Everyone who's a Jew has come to Jerusalem and they're in the middle of this festival. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in just a minute. Um, like this was a massive party going on and Jesus is, is teaching in the temple during the day. And 
Uh, that doesn't seem very secret, but because people are believing in him, they are not in a position where they can arrest him. And we see that people begin believing because, and they say, like, is, can he do who the Messiah, could he do more signs? Like, no, like this is him. And they started to believe in him. Um, and then the Pharisees, so verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to, to arrest him. And Jesus said, I will be with you a little longer. And then I'm going to him who sent me, you will seek me and you will not find me where I am. You cannot come. And the Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me and where I am, you cannot come. And so we see Jesus again, kind of using these heavenly spiritual references and the people not getting it. They're trying to put it in earthly terms and they're like, I just don't understand. Um, and so, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the rest of the passage and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to really dive into what we're about to read um, in verse 37 through 39. Um, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And when they heard these words, some of the people said, this is really the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was division among the people and some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. Just side note, um, Micah 5, 2 through 5 is the prophecy where it says that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem, which is part of Judah's inheritance land, which is where David was from. Verse 45, the officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to him, why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered him, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee to search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee? Okay, so um, we see in verse 37, on the last day, the great day, Jesus cried out, um, stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Okay, so I'm going to tell you guys about this water pouring or the water drawing ceremony. Um, because when I was reading this, y'all, I was just blown, <laughs> I was just blown away by our God. Like, we miss so much by not understanding the cultural context of what is going on during this feast. Um, to us, we're like, yeah, Jesus, living water, great. Um, come to him and you'll be refreshed. Awesome. Um, okay, so. It is said that no one, uh, that if you have never witnessed the water pouring or the water drawing ceremony, you have never witnessed true joy. I've read, I've read, mul I mean, I probably read a dozen websites about this, um, studying um, this. I went way deep down this rabbit hole, y'all. Um, this feast was a party. It was a massive party in Jerusalem. Um, it's reported that no eye saw sleep for eight days. There are stories of rabbis juggling, dancing, singing, clapping, playing instruments, even doing acrobatics. Um, they would even construct bleachers or um, grandstands for people to watch. And after the party all night that's lit by those giant lanterns that I talked about, um, they would go to the pool of Salome and they would take these golden vessels and they would fill them with water 
and there would be a processional to the temple through the water gate. And when they got to the water gate, they would blow the shofar to announce them entering the temple. Now I read a couple different things. Like some said they do it every morning. Some said they do it once at the beginning of the festival, but every day for seven days, they would then go and they would, um, they would take, uh, they had two bowls um, each with a spout and they would pour wine through one and water through another and it would pour out and it would flow over the, um, the, the altar that is in the courtyard of the temple. Now wine was often poured like every time there was a sacrifice, the, the wine would pour out, but it was only during the Feast of Tabernacles that the water would be poured out as well. Um, and this water came from the Pool of Siloam, which you can find on your map. And you'll notice there's a little dotted line that goes out of the city wall that goes to the Gihon Spring. Um, and so unlike, remember when we read about the Pool of Bethesda where he healed the man on the Sabbath, that was a place where they collected the rainwater. That was one of the ways in which the consider, was considered living water was collecting rainwater. But this one was fed by the Gihon Spring. Um, and so it was a living spring of water that fed this pool. Um, and uh, this is something I want to do a little bit more research on. But one of the websites I was reading said that this is the pool that the kings in the line of David were anointed. Um, and it was the water from this pool that became synonymous with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Okay, keep tracking with me. So the priest would pour it out over the altar. And I've seen, I read a lot of different um, symbols that people said this was but um one a couple people said that um it was to pray over the rainy season because they just pulled in the harvest and so they would be replanting and getting ready for the rain to grow those seeds as i talked about in um in my email this week talking about praying for rain because it would water those seeds and cause it to grow um some thought uh, believed it was a symbol and i think this is probably more what i would think um of the water because uh, flowing from the rock in the wilderness um, and that the water would one day pour out over the people through the Messiah. Um, and then, um, so it has this tie toward the coming Messiah um, and the hope um, of the King coming in the line of David. So remember, Pula Salome, anointing Kings in the line of David. Um, and, so it is in this, and they, um, this is the verse in Isaiah 12, one through six, um, that is kind of the background of this idea of drawing water and then taking it and pouring it out in the temple. You will say in that day, this is verse one of Isaiah 12, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust I will not be afraid for the Lord God is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation with joy. You will draw water from the well of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And so we see this, mess this messianic um, prophecy in Isaiah that is talking about God being the salvation and drawing water from the well of salvation. Um, and Jesus' words, he says, come to me who is thirsty. That's in Isaiah 55. Um, and so here's what's really cool. So this last day of the feast is called Hoshana Rabbah, which means great salvation. So the great day where Jesus stands up and says for all to hear, if anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Okay, y'all put it all together. And this is on the day of great salvation. Jesus, where they have been drawing water, pointing not only to God's provision, but also to the future Messiah that will come. And in this background of this psalm that is talking about um, 
Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One stands up and says, this is me. Come to me. And not only will I give you a spring of living water, no, I will give you a river of flowing water. And and he will pour out his spirit. So anytime they anointed somebody, it was a in the Old Testament, it usually had the idea that the spirit would rest on that person. And so when they anointed Saul king, um, God's spirit rested on him. And then as Saul walked in disobedience, God removed his spirit from Saul. And he put his spirit on David when he anointed David as king. And so this water that is from the pool that would have anointed the king is now being poured out. And Jesus, like, sorry, y'all, I just am really excited. Like I geeked out over this, that he is the Holy One of Israel. He's saying, it's me. I have come to pour my living water, to pour the Holy Spirit out on you and let it well up in your life. And I love, remember how we talked about how John continues to give us the interpretation. He says um, that this is the Holy Spirit. Now remember that um, he is um, writing this probably in the 80s or 90 AD. So this is 60 years afterward. And so the Holy Spirit has already been poured out. And so it's almost like he is saying, hey, remember Jesus said this, and now you guys see it. His Holy Spirit is resting on you. Um, And I think what's really important is to also remember that he's writing this post the destruction of the temple. And so he's saying, listen, Jesus is the fulfillment of this because they were no longer practicing this, this ceremony because the temple was no longer there. And so He's saying, listen, the Holy Spirit's been poured out. We don't need to pour out this water anymore because he has already poured out his spirit on you and he has given you rivers of living water inside of you through the Holy Spirit. And this was the irony for me, y'all. So Jesus stands up and he says this, and then we continue to see the discord and the disbelief among among the people, among the, especially the, the religious leaders of the day, is that they often, I read several articles that talked about how they, they would quote Psalm 115 to 118 throughout this festival. And I'm gonna read to you this portion of Psalm 118. Uh, 19 through 24. Open to me the gate of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. So remember, they would walk through the gate. Okay. Um, They would walk through, we're going to talk in John 10 about the sheep gate, like how they would have to walk through the gate. Um, I thank you that you have become my salvation and Uh, that you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Y'all, do you see the irony? That Jesus, they're reading these passages and it talks about the stone that the builders rejected. The the ones who were building the church, the Levites, the religious leaders, the ones who were supposed to be the ones pointing them, looking for the Messiah, and then pointing them to the Messiah, they missed it. And instead, they rejected him, and they sought to kill him. And they they are literally watching themselves be what this psalm is talking about as it's being read in that moment, in on the this last day of the festival. Um, and y'all, I just couldn't get this picture out of my head, this picture of now us as his temple with the Holy Spirit being rivers of water flowing out of me. I am just so thankful for Jesus. I have been so thankful for him in these days, these days that often feel dark the days where I feel parched, the days where I feel thirsty and tired and weary, that our God continues to flow this living water in us. Um, In your small groups, um, 
I want y'all to read Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12. Um, I don't have time to go into it right now. Um, or if you're listening to this um, on podcast or watching on YouTube, um, take some time and go read Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12 and read it and see the imagery through the lens of what I just shared about this festival and about who Jesus is. Um, and I want to close with this because we have to remain connected to the source. We, if we want to, he will continue to, he's not going to take the river of living water away from us. It will continue to spring up in us. But sometimes I feel like I lose touch with what he is doing in my life because I become distracted, because I look away, because I'm, I'm trying to figure life out or I'm getting to, I'm just, I'm focused elsewhere and I forget that he has put that in me and that he is refreshing me, that he is literally giving me life. I want to close with Psalm 1, 1 through 3. It said, blessed is the man who walks not in the way of sinners. Noah sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. This is why I love Bible study. This is why I love studying scripture this way. Um, this is why I love not just having a quiet time in the morning where I check this off my list and I go about my day. Because this calls us to be constantly connected, to be delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating on it day and night, like a stream, like a tree planted by a stream of water. A tree that's planted by a stream of water has a constant flow of nourishment. And as you read Ezekiel 47, you're going to see these trees that have the constant flow of the river of living water that flows from the temple. I was listening to a sermon yesterday um, and he was talking about the rich mercy of, um, of our God. And he put it this way. He said, God is not rich in mercy because he has a lot of mercy. He is rich in mercy because he is mercy. His character is mercy. His character is love. His character is patience. His character is holy. And because of that, that flow never runs out. You never run out of who God is because it's who he is. It is not what he has. And so as we go this week, let's remember that, yes, we have wisdom and discernment when we are dealing with others. And let's continue to do the hard work of being in his word day and night, thinking on his word day and night. That's why I love going through these passages slowly because they marinate, they get in me. I remember them more um, clearly because I don't just brush through them really quick. And so let's sit and let's allow his living water, his river to nourish our souls and provide for us what only he can provide. <laughs>